Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Clone Trooper is the galaxy's toughest and best trained infantry soldier. He's made from the best stock oh, and no. given the best tools the Republic can afford. This is all to aid him on his mission to defend the Republic and democracy. The Clone Trooper faces an enemy that outnumbers him greatly. Soulless battle droids churned out in the Outer Rim factories made of cheap materials and cheap software. They say a Clone Trooper must kill at least 100 B-1 battle droids to justify his own training time and costs. And there's no better tool to aid him on his glorious and very honorable mission than Republic Fire Support. Fire support by definition is any type of weapon that assists infantry missions. Fire support can mean a lot more than just artillery. Fire support comes in all sorts of different shapes and forms and even different altitudes. Today we're going to take a look at the 10 best fire support available for the clone army. The M201 mortar system is the Republic's lightest and most mobile indirect fire support platform. We first see them in action during the Battle of Umbara in 20 BBY in the hands of the famous 501st Legion. Umbara was an incredibly difficult campaign for the clones. The planet was located inside of a nebula and lacked starlight, making the surface perpetually dark and covered in mist and fog. Most of the planet was overrun by thick jungles full of carnivorous plants, and so the terrain was basically unsuitable for anything larger than an all-terrain reconnaissance transport. And so the 501st would utilize mortar squads to pin down enemy positions and destroy them. The standard M201 mortar system used by the GAR could be carried and operated efficiently by a single rifleman. These were cheap and easy to use weapons and they weighed around 20 kilograms or one of those big 45 pound weight plates at the gym. Clone mortars had a maximum range of only 750 meters and they had a kill radius of around three meters. These mortars would be classified as light mortars, something equivalent to a 60 millimeter mortar here on Earth. One of the big advantages of this mortar system is that it didn't use explosives in the shell to project the uh, projectiles. Instead, it used electromagnetics, sort of like a railgun. There are several benefits to this type of firing system. There's less sound, less secondary recoil, and more gradual acceleration from the projectile, which leads to less wear and tear on the barrel. This is probably why this mortar is so simple and can be fired by one individual and lacks any kind of recoil system built in. The 501st mortar squads were typically made up of six riflemen with mortar tubes on their backs. They could literally deploy their weapons and fire within seconds thanks to the modern rangefinders built onto their helmets. Because of the low yield explosives used in these light mortars, these mortar squads would oftentimes fire in clusters, maximizing their area damage. The M201 mortar system could go anywhere that a clone trooper could lug it, making it one of the most versatile indirect fire platforms in the entire GAR. This weapon could also be placed on the back of an ATRT. The only other fire support that the 501st could depend on on Umbara was air support. The Republic Navy had many different types of starfighters that were capable of fire support missions, but none were better suited for the mission than the BTL Y-Wing Starfighter. The Y-Wing combined a large payload with decent armor, along with low altitude in atmosphere maneuverability and performance, making it very much the A-10 Warthog of the clone army. Sure, it lacked the massive rotary blaster cannon that is the size of a small speeder, but what's important about the Y-Wing is that it could stay on station for a pretty long time and deliver multiple attack runs with surprising accuracy. These birds were armed with two laser cannons and two ion cannons for strafing and had proton torpedo launchers and dumb proton bombs. Whether it's the deep jungles of Umbara or the irradiated plains of Geonosis, when a clone company is in danger of being overrun, there's no more welcome sight than a low-flying Y-Wing. And just like the A-10 Warthog, despite many attempts to retire the Y-Wing, it's basically operated way beyond its expected operational lifespan. This is why during the Rebellion, you still have the Y-Wing, and even during the First Order Resistance Conflict, you would still have new variants of the Y-Wing, which would very much remain unchanged from its original design. If it ain't broke, you don't gotta fix it. Anti-tank guns were created as sort of a cheap way to counter mechanized units and armored units. 
You essentially take the main gun off of a tank and put it on a stable firing platform. There's limited armor, no engine or propulsion system, and very few other knickknacks attached to it. You can essentially hide these suckers all over the place, and they can create a lot of problems for an armored column, and they're extremely cheap to deploy. What makes the AV-7 anti-vehicle cannon so great is that it has a massive heavy cannon, but it also is self-propelled. It might not look like it, but it actually has repulsor lifts built into its frame, and so it can basically float anywhere, and once it's ready to deploy, it will deploy its four large legs that will anchor it into firing position. During the Battle of Christophus, Obi-Wan Kenobi uses a line of AV-7 to abruptly stop an entire column of Separatist AAT hover tanks. These massive cannons packed a huge punch, but they were also relatively exposed. And so there's no better way to grow some hair on the nads of a clone artilleryman than by dropping him in the seat of an AV-7 and have him exchange direct fire with a Seppi tank just a few hundred yards in the distance. When it comes to saturating an area with an immense amount of destructive power, there's nothing better than a rocket or missile barrage. The accuracy of such weapons are limited, but the amount of physical and psychological damage these systems can inflict on an enemy makes it an extremely useful part of the GAR arsenal. The 38th Armored Division was able to outfit a beat-up A5RX battle tank with a multi-missile launcher system, and they used it successfully to defend themselves from enemy forces. I can only imagine how well this weapon system would have done during the first battle of Geonosis where you had a lot of target-rich environments. When you militarize space, you eventually are going to want to fire crap from space onto the ground because it's epic for you and terrible and demoralizing for the enemy. Well, let's take advantage of that high ground. I have the high ground. <laughs> While the Venator class Star Destroyer was the most common ship of the line in the Republic Navy, we on this channel have reclassified it as a carrier based on its massive complement of fighters and lack of heavy weapons. The fact that all the turbo lasers on the ship are positioned topside also means that it doesn't have great orbital bombardment capabilities, which is kind of what we need in this scenario. This is where the Victory class Star Destroyer, or as I like to call it, the Indigenous People Widowmaker slash Crimes Against Civilization Maker comes into play. Deployed in the last years of the Clone Wars, this was basically the Empire and the Republic's first true Star Destroyer, aka Battleship. It was armed to the teeth with 40 double turbo lasers and capable of atmospheric flight. One of the large problems with turbo laser fire is that when it hits a thick atmosphere, it typically decreases the potency and accuracy of these weapons. These are energy-based projectiles designed more for vacuum. When a ship the size of a Victory can hover in low atmosphere and rain down turbo laser fire, it's basically game over for the enemy, especially if they don't have anti-aircraft cannons. You see, any kind of weapon that's used for space combat is usually ridiculously scaled up. Even an X-Wing's wingtip lasers can make quick work of an armored vehicle. And so, a full-on turbo laser strike against an infantry formation is something you definitely don't want to witness firsthand. The SPHA, or the Self-Propelled Heavy Artillery Walker, is one of the largest weapons platforms available for ground troops in the Grand Army of the Republic. It could be mounted with all sorts of massive weapons, but was most commonly deployed with a turbo laser. This was an incredibly awkward weapon that had many severe design flaws, though. Originally, the SPHA had a turret designed for its main gun, but it was deemed way too complex to outfit, so it basically depends on its legs to move around and aim its main gun. The problem was the SPHA was extremely heavy and needed a lot of armor, especially around the massive reactor core that powered the vehicle. It also had really short legs, making any kind of movement painfully slow. And while the SPHA did have a capital ship class turbo laser mounted on top of it, it wasn't exactly very useful against ground troops because the uh, main gun couldn't depress enough to engage enemy forces on level ground which is why the SPHA turbo laser variant is best used as an anti-capital ship weapon. It's a great deterrent for even something as large as a Victory class Star Destroyer, and during the Battle of Geonosis, these SPHAs prevented several Lucra Hulk class core ships from escaping the planet. The SPHA could be deployed with a variety of different weapons aside from turbo lasers. They could also be deployed with ion cannons, mass drivers, uh, missile banks, and even thermobaric burst weapons. These were kind of projectiles that are sent into the upper atmosphere of a planet and it would basically ignite the atmosphere, killing a lot of people. The SPHA turbo laser variant was also used by Anakin Skywalker to defend the vulnerable hangar doors of a Venator class Star Destroyer during the Battle of Coruscant. 
The relationship between a clone trooper and an LAAT is a special one, and perhaps even more special than the relation between a clone trooper and a Y-Wing. And that's because the sight of an LAAT over Battlefield can only mean positive things. Either it's a heavy lift version designed to bring an ATTE walker in to reinforce you, or it's a troop carrier bringing in more clones. Or better yet, it could be here to take you off the battlefield. There's also another reason why you might be happy to see one of these, and that's because the LAAT makes a terrific gun ship. The LAAT is armed with a pair of laser beam turrets guided by a vigilant crew chief and his gunner. It also has a belt-fed mass driver missile launcher on it, which is as awesome as it sounds. With the help of an air combat control team, an LAAT is a very versatile gunship platform. It's basically a Black Hawk, a Chinook, and an Apache, and Mother Goose all rolled into one. There's even a pressurized version of the LAAT which can deploy clone troopers in space. Like a lot of things in the Republic military, the ATTE is misclassified and extremely versatile at the same time. It's considered the main battle walker tank for Republic ground forces, but a close look at its design reveals two interesting things. For one, it has the capacity and supplies to take on an entire platoon for several weeks, making this vehicle more of an armored personnel carrier than just a mere tank. It also has a very large mass driver cannon on top of it, which could be useful for a variety of different types of fire support missions. Powered by an electromagnetic rail firing system, the mass driver cannon can fire anything from energy projectiles to armored piercing shells. This means that the ATTE is very useful against almost all types of targets. On top of that, this mini walking fortress has six anti-personnel laser cannons, which allows it to be deployed directly into the middle of a fight. These walking beasts were also light enough for an LAAT to bring it directly into the battlefield. The RX-200 Falchion class assault tank looks very similar to the larger SPHA platform we were talking about, but it has some very unique differences. First, it's mainly equipped with a giant ion cannon, and also the entire vehicle is mounted on top of a repulsor lift, which greatly increases its maneuverability and speed. On top of that, the ion cannon also is mounted on a turret, allowing it to target and engage enemies at a much faster speed. The RX-200 would be the preferred anti-aircraft solution for clone trooper ground forces, and it was also extremely useful against gigantic kaiju-level monsters. If the ATTE is a walking fortress for a platoon of clone troopers, then the HAV WA6 Juggernaut tank is basically a rolling fortress for an entire company of clone troopers. This massive 10-wheeled armored vehicle was armed to the teeth and ridiculously fast. They could reach speeds of 160 kilometers per hour or 100 miles per hour on flat and even terrain. The Juggernaut, or the turbo tank as it was called, had heavy laser cannons, anti-personnel blaster cannons, along with grenade launchers, providing this vehicle with a 360-degree arc of supporting fire. Once dug in, the HAVW was basically a mobile command center, a very heavily armed one. The Grand Army of the Republic heavily relies on combined armed tactics, and so fire support weapons become increasingly important in this type of military force. And as you can see, the Grand Army of the Republic has no shortage of awesome fire support. Let me know in the comment section below which one's your favorite. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the awesome content that we regularly put out on this channel. Anyway, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.